Connie Edgar, European Commissioner for Climate Action. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And thank you for hosting us today in Brussels. The 2030 European Framework on Energy and Climate proposes a single binding national target on emissions, while setting a European-wide target on renewable energy consumption, at least 27%. Efficiency will be discussed later this year. Why this new approach right now, and how will Europe benefit from it? Well, why this new approach? When it comes to greenhouse gases, it is the old, well-known approach. You have two sort of set of way of doing it, the ETS sector, and there people buy the allowances on a European market. And then you have the non-ETS sector, and there will be burden sharing, totally as in the 2020 package, binding on member states, no changes there. But it's true that when it comes to renewables, there is one change. We still propose that we need a binding European target for renewables. Why a change so that we do not say that it should be binding also in each individual member state? I believe that if we had at this stage, now not even out of the crisis, if we have told each member state, this is your share of renewables, this is your share of renewables. The renewables target would have been dead by now. We also have a Lisbon Treaty, a European Treaty, that says that the energy mix is up to each individual member states. So if it came too much sort of top down now, when also renewables have to be at least 27% of the whole energy consumption, uh, I could just see that there would be huge political problems. Don't forget that when environment ministers for the eight, from the eight most renewables friendly countries, member states, when they before Christmas sent a letter to the commission, oh, don't forget renewables, they forgot one word. They forgot to write about the word binding. And there was nothing about binding at member states, but even not binding at the European level. So I would say one should not take a sort of, a, draw too many conclusions that it is it is not serious. When there is a European binding target, it can be a serious thing. It's binding on Europe. I very much understand that some will say, yes, but what does that mean if it's not binding on in individual member states? That is the governance mechanism that has to be identified now in all the details. But basically, you can do that. You can ask all the member states, what are you planning to do when it comes to renewables? Like a more bottom-up procedure. Then you get all the answers. When you add them up, and it does not add up to the at least 27%, then of course Europe could say, oh, thank you for all these uh, offers. It does not add up to the at least 27. Now, if from the European level, if we invested more in interconnectors, if, you help, if we help you to get the infrastructure right, if we get the subsidy schemes uh, right, and if we do this and that at the European level, would that then change any assumption in each individual member state, then you might get some add-ons to what has already been announced. And in the end, we still have to find out in the energy services of the Commission exactly how to make it as credible for investors when you have a binding target at the European level as if it was also binding at member states level. So it was a, it's another approach, but it doesn't mean that we do not have a binding target provided, of course, that the heads of state will endorse that we still have a binding target on renewables, which I very much hope. Uh, and on efficiency, uh, the Energy Commissioner Uttinger, he had promised Parliament when the Energy Efficiency Directive was adopted middle of 2012, that it should be reviewed after t two years, that is middle this year. And there uh, he did not want to come out with new proposals on efficiency until he has re re reviewed what is already there as new legislation. So uh, Commissioner Uttinger announced in front of the European Parliament when they had their 2030 discussion that this September, October, he would present the next steps in efficiency. So efficiency is not forgotten. It just has to follow the sequence following out of what has earlier been promised uh, among others, to the European Parliament. The 2030 framework proposes an increase of the linear reduction factor determining the cap for emissions and the market stability reserve mechanism. Are these changes going to impact the functioning of the EU ETS and how will this interact with backloading? 
Backloading does not eat up the surplus. You can say that backloading, that was a stabilizing initiative. That is now done, it is adopted, now it's being implemented. But we need something that could first take care that we're never having to do something like backloading again, that you would have it automatically built into the system, that if you have a very extraordinary economic situation in one way or the other, then there is automaticity in the way the system is dealing with very extraordinary situations. That is what this uh, reserve mechanism is intended to do. And then provided that the 28 member states can agree with the Commission to go to 40% greenhouse gas reduction domestically in Europe in 2030, then it is only logic that you will have to increase the annual correction factor from this 1.74 to 2.2. That would fit with going to a 40% target in 2030. You can say it's a slow way of eating up the surplus, but you will eat up the surplus. Of course, there can be one discussion. Why don't we do it and propose that it should be done before 2020? Why are we only saying it should be after 2020? Because else we would be accused of retroactively changing the conditions for the 2020 package. But I'm glad to see that already since we proposed this back in January this year, that uh, the price actually has gone up. It was for something when we presented this, now it's com coming close to, to seven. So I think that slowly you will see the market respond to the fact that they know that the surplus will be eaten up in the years after 2020. And what role do you think the European 2030 framework on energy and climate can play at the Paris Conference on Climate Change that will take place at the end of 2015? It depends on what kind of targets we can agree upon. Say that in Europe we could agree on a 35% target, then I think it would play a very negative role because then others would think that they have a free ticket to, to be modest. Uh, whereas if we go for and agree 40% domestic effort done in Europe with offsetting coming on top of that, then I think it would send a strong signal to other big emitters. And in that sense, I think that it could play a very constructive role prior to the Paris conference. I think if we can do with, say with, with great honesty, we have done our utmost and we have taken our fair share of, of the combined effort needed, then uh, the Americans would really feel that, oops, now next, uh, it's your turn to come up with what you are planning to do. And I think already the Commission proposal has had this impact on the Americans. They are speeding up their deliberations. And I would, of course, very much hope that other big emitters, such as China, would also feel that when Europe is doing its fair share, it's also time for some of the big emerging economies to do their fair share. What we have actually tried to do with this package is also to focus on what is Europe's own interest. If we play it intelligently, we can send a strong signal to the international negotiations, and that is important for EU's leadership role in these ne negotiations. But I think that we also now with Ukraine and the Russian and Crimea crisis, we really see not only the economic cost of Europe's energy dependency, but also the political cost. And that is why if you really study the 22nd of January proposal from the Commission, it is very much addressing what would serve Europe's own interest to do. Energy dependency wise, energy grid and structure wise, uh, economically, job-wise, innovation-wise, and of course also climate-wise to do our fair share. But it's just to say that we are not just doing this because of the rest of the world. We are also doing it because we are one of the regions in the world most dependent on imported fossil fuels from outside. That is not a sustainable economic path for the future. That's also a very good reason why we should now endorse these targets. Thank you for your answers and we hope to see you soon in Florence. Thank you very much for your interest. Goodbye. Goodbye.